Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this is going to be probably part one of three on CT of incidental omas, how we manage them. And we speak a lot about incidental omas. I think it's one of the things that all of us do face in practice. And it's interesting, as scanners get better, we see more and more incidental omas. And the term incidental oma, an unsuspected finding in an organ or organ system that was not the primary source of the patient's presentation. And the key with these incidental findings, of course, is the determinant significance and whether or not it needs further evaluation. I think in the scheme of things, if you take a 50,000 foot overview, most incidental omas are of no clinical significance, but others are. Incidental omas are so popular that it even has its own Wikipedia page. And if you look carefully, look at the things they list, adrenal, renal, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, pulmonary nodule, and others. So it's all sorts of things that indeed we think about. And most of these I'm going to discuss during this talk. Even in the New York Times, in the consult section, the incidental loma problem with medical scans. CT scans often turn up incidental findings that are better left untreated. So what do we think about and how do we handle this and what's a practical approach, okay? So we looked at incidental findings and of course one of the big questions is how do you manage incidental findings? And what we wanted to know is, and partly because I had gotten some complaints that some clinicians say, one person recommends that you follow a nodule this way, someone else recommends another way. And so what we did is we did a simple study. We came up with 12 common incidental CT findings from thyroid nodules to lung nodules to coronary calcification, adrenal, pancreas, liver, you name it, renal, jejunal inception. So we had 12 things. And we asked people how you managed it. And to get beyond Hopkins alone, we looked at three different institutions, NYU, Stanford, and Hopkins. And in the 12 things, 70% of greater agreement was for only six of the findings. One sonomy thyroid nodule, a cyst in the postmenopausal woman in the ovary, pulmonary nodule, coronary calcification, and uh, short uh, segment small bowel interception and a 1CM cyst. Half of them, there was no agreement at all. And what we found was it wasn't a Hopkins thing or a Stanford thing or an NYU thing. And we also found that not only was agreement lacking, but it was true across institutions and within departments for six of the most common things we saw. And even the things we all commonly saw, the other six, it was only 70% or so in agreement. And one of the things we said, of course, is that there may not be a perfect answer for how to manage each of the incidental omas, but you need to have some sort of strategy, and you can't have five radiologists give five opinions. We need to be on the same page in our own department. Other people have gone so far, this article by Colin Feister, that incidental findings are so common, um, and the potential cost and emotional cost to patients in the healthcare system due to incidental findings, perhaps we need to get informed consent. Look at the statement. This was an AJR. Given that incidental findings are very common in high-res imaging, patients should be provided information about the possibility of an incidental finding as part of a radiologic informed consent. Obviously, that was written six years ago, and obviously no one paid attention to that. But the point is, you can see the issue. If I ask you how often can you expect to see an incidental finding, there are a number of different ways of thinking about it. You can go back to this article by Brad Zawoski, who was looking at whole body screening, which means you were scanning well patients, and a third of them had abnormal findings. Now, some of the findings, maybe you can argue, weren't that important, but 19 cancers were detected, aneurysms were detected, uh, ovarian cysts, and what you learn is that even in a normal population, theoretically normal, you're going to find important findings. And also, depending on what studies you're doing, you're going to find incidental findings. Many things depend on the age of the patient. If you're scanning younger patients in the PEDS population, you're not going to find many incidental findings. If you're scanning TAVR patients and everybody's over 80, you're going to find a lot of incidental findings. So just a few examples. This article by Nadu 
was looking at patients where we were scanning the abdominal aorta and lower extremities, which tends to mean it's older patients, and 15% had previously undiagnosed highly important findings. Highly important findings were in uh, 40 patients. Of 462 findings overall, 43 were high importance, 77 moderate, and 342 of low importance. But you could see that there were a number of critical findings. And where are the important findings? Kidney, lung, and liver. And of course, we know that probably makes a lot of sense because if you think about incidental renal carcinomas, renal cell carcinomas, two-thirds of them are picked up incidentally. Uh, so kidney, and then of course, lung nodules, liver masses, and the like. Uh, Nadu makes the point that you need to look very carefully because of many of these important findings, particularly cancer. Song wrote an article where they looked at patients who were being evaluated for hematuria. Now, remember, the prior article showed that the kidney was one of the most common reasons for an incidental finding. In this study, because it's a hematuria, anything related to the kidney was not considered incidental but was considered primary. They still had 6.8% of patients had clinically important or potentially important incidental findings. And the prevalence of clinical important findings was again, 6.8%. That's even dropping the kidneys. So you can imagine the kidneys often is equal to, and that's what bring it up into the double digits. So when I ask what helps to find the frequency of incidental findings, area of body scanned, the more area scanned, the more areas you're gonna find abnormalities. The reasons for doing the study, the protocol used. Uh, if you do non-contrast, you may see less findings than doing with good IV. The age of the patient, the older the patient, the more incidental findings there are typically, and who is reading the study. And I say that because some people cannot read a study as normal. They see this thing by the kidney, probably normal, can't rule out mass. Something in the adrenal, probably adenoma, can't rule out neoplasm. In the spine, probably ossified, but can't rule out sarcoma. You get the drift. And all of us have people like that in our own group. Now, when you do TAVR patients, 17.1%, but TAVRs typically were patients over age 70. And so if you're going to pick up incidental findings, it's not surprising, be it lung cancer, be it diverticulitis, be it effusions, be it other cancers. And so again, depending on the population, you're going to find more or less incidental findings. The older the population, the more incidental findings there are. And in that article by Staub, you can see aneurysms, pancreatic cancer, pulmonary and colon cancer. You can see some of the basic findings. Now, this goes back to the management question. Now, sometimes you see a renal mass and it's a cancer. That's an easy management. Send it to the urologist. They'll make a decision whether to do a nephrectomy, a partial nephrectomy, or when it's small enough, just simply follow a tumor, perhaps. But for other things, this lesion that's indeterminate in the liver, what do you do? What's its significance? Do you need to do an MR? Do you need to do a biopsy? Should the patient go to surgery? What do you tell the patient? And perhaps, who pays for it? Is it incidental finding? Will the insurance company pay or will be out of pocket? And we know that most incidental findings are not going to be important, but you can see 7 to 17% or so will be important and include cancer like renal cell or aneurysms or lung tumors, PEs or pancreatic cystic lesions. Now, if you look at the different areas we scan patients, one of the most challenging with incidental findings is going to be the ER because often you have no comparison films, you have minimal history, the protocol may be variable, and that is one of the challenges. So we learn about managing patients. So for example, if I showed you this case, you see a high density mass in the left kidney, 86 Hounsfield units, you know it's a high density renal cyst, easy. Anything above 70, well-defined as high-density renal cyst, benign, leave alone. But look, if I only gave you this image of that patient, now you see a solid mass in the left kidney. Now it's a renal cell, maybe papillary, maybe an oncocytoma. What is it? Well, you know, with delayed phase, it really doesn't change much. But if the delayed phase was exactly the same, and it was the only thing you had, you would again say papillary renal cell carcinoma. So 
You can see if you have multiple phases, it's easy to make the diagnosis, but in the ER, often you have limited phases and limited information. We do have some rules we've developed. Homogeneous renal mass measuring over 70 on non-contrast CT is 99.9% .9 benign, high-density renal cyst. So if you have a non-contrast CT and you see one of these lesions, it's a leave-alone lesion. O'Connor, incidental finding of a renal mass is common on non-contrast CT. Mean attenuation alone appears reliable for determining whether a mass needs further evaluation. And so what they looked at was what did you see in patients who had tumors, for example? How do you look at that or benign lesions? And so they felt that if a mass was a centimeter or larger and it was less than 20 Hounsfield units or contained fat or over 70, then it was benign. Less than 20 over 70. But 20 to 74 would be of concern and considered indeterminate. Pooler actually looked up and found a very similar thing, when they looked at non-contrast scans, they were able to show that when things are non-contrast in the 20 to 70 range, they were concerning, but outside that range, they were typically not going to be a problem. And the average tumor was about 37 on non-contrast CT. So again, using information, and this helps you decide whether to bring a patient back for a contrast study or follow-up non-contrast what do you need to do? So there's our rule, over 70 high-density renal cyst, again, well-defined, no dystrophic calcifications, under 20 but above zero, a simple cyst, negative angiomyelipoma, and 20 to 70 is indeterminate, again, noting that 37 is going to be a renal cell carcinoma. You can see the challenges. I show you this case, it looks like a solid mass. Remember, 25% of renal masses resected are going to be benign, and that's because, in part, this reason. What do you do with this lesion? It looks like it's enhancing, maybe papillary. Here's excretory phase. If you only have this, it's benign. But, you know, when you have the excretory phase and you have the venous phase or the arterial phase and things measure exactly the same, you better be thinking that you're dealing with a high-density renal cyst. Lesions enhance, lesions wash out, but things are never the same across multiple phases. When they are, you have to think there's no enhancement, but it's a high-density structure. And so in this patient, we went back, got, got a non-contrast scan, and there you see the high-density lesion left kidney. It was a high-density renal cyst. It was not a tumor, and this patient did not need to get a partial nephrectomy. Beautiful example shown right here. Now, of course, if we have fat in a lesion, here's an easy case, large angiomyelipoma, lots of fat in the lesion, axial and coronal. There's not much else for that. Um, you can see dystrophic fat in a large aggressive tumor that invades the perirenal space, but this is a solid mass, and this is one of the larger angiomyelipomas because we see many smaller ones. Nice septation, fat density, no problem really easy to make the diagnosis. So again, those are some of the key points as relates to the kidney. And it's not uncommon for, as I mentioned, 25% of renal cells, 25% of renal masses rather, under 4CM that are resected or benign because people don't think about things like high density renal cysts. Okay, what else? Usually when I think about adrenals, that's the term where incidental loma comes from. We, depending on the population you look at, it's very common to see adenomas. If you have older patients, particularly women, particularly diabetics, particularly patients who are obese, you can see 5 to 10% incidental adrenal adenomas. They're of no clinical importance. And in this article uh, by Song, 5% or so of patients had incidental adrenal lesions. Now, their finding was that when you have an incidental adrenal lesion, it's always going to be benign. And they went on to even say if things were a bit denser than 10 Hounsfield units, it was still going to be benign. And then Corwin went on to say that even if you had a patient with a known malignancy, if you pick up an incidental adrenal lesion and it's low density, unilateral or bilateral, it's likely going to be benign. We found no case of malignancy in 322 incidentally detected bilateral adrenal nodules at CT in patients who had no cancer. Okay, now if you have a lung cancer, you see adrenal lesion, 
you better be thinking metastasis, be it in one adrenal or in two. But, you know, if you just have incidental lesions in a patient with no known cancer, then likely it's going to be benign. And this is a very important article. The f this finding of our study is important because the increased use and resolution of CT have led to an increase in incidental findings unrelated to the original clinical information. This can lead to extensive further cascades of imaging and interventional workups that can be costly and cause morbidity and psychological stress. So again, you need to know what to call, but you don't want to overcall things. Now, it's kind of interesting the difference between radiologists and some endocrine people. We know that 99% of incidental adrenal lesions under 4 cm well-defined are adenomas. Every once in a while, as I'll show you, you have a pheo, maybe you have a mild lipoma. But here they were saying, hey, if you find an incidental adrenal thing, this warrants clinical biochemical and radiologic evaluation to establish a secretory status and risk of malignancy. Okay, identification of, of an adrenal incidentaloma, not artificial intelligence, may, may be an opportunity to identify an underlying secretory tumor that has been unrecognized. Well, you know, that's theoretical, but that's not very logical. Very few people have secreting tumors, and when they do, they present. Incidental findings is not what you're going to be looking at. And this idea of working every patient up with an incidental adrenal lesion is something we don't follow at Hopkins, and I think it's something someone wrote in an article, but it isn't something we do. Now, when you think about adrenal masses, what do we look at? Size, unilateral versus bilateral, attenuation, presence of calcification of fat, enhancement pattern, and clinical history. If you tell me a patient has lung cancer, melanoma, I, I would think of a met when I see a solid mass. But if you tell me there's nothing and now the adrenal is low density, I'm telling you it's an adenoma without even looking. And most people will say anything under 10, and many people say under 20, Hounsfield units well-defined is an adenoma. Case closed. Now, the challenge with adrenals, of course, we know is the fact that here's a nice lesion, low density on non-contrast, and it measures zero. Adenoma, next case. But this was a renal, and you gave IV contrast, and if you only looked at the adrenal here, 64 Hounsfield units. What is that? I don't know. Could it be a solid mass? It sure can. It's well-defined, but it's 64. Well, what we learned is adrenal adenomas, and most adrenal lesions wash out, but adenomas wash out quickly, and by 15 minutes are washing out more than 60%, and that's going to be an adenoma. Now, there are certain exceptions to the rule. The one thing that can fool you are pheochromocytomas. Pheos can wash out more than 50% because they're very vascular. What we say is, if a lesion in the adrenal enhances above 110, it's a pheo. At the end of the day, no adenoma is enhancing above 110. They never really go above 70, but 110 is far away. So if you see this incidental adrenal lesion, it's measuring 50 Hounsfield units, but you have to say incidental, it looks benign, well-defined. Let's leave it alone. It looks like nothing. It's hanging off the limb. It's nothing. But then as you go on, and you, you give a contrast, and you do a renal pro, adrenal protocol, that nodule's enhancing to 164. I don't care what it washes out to. That is going to be a pheochromocytoma. That's it. And that's what it was. So again, we need to be carefully looking at this. Now, under the adrenal incidentalomas, when something's all fat, it's a myelipoma. Leave alone. Over 5 cm, they can bleed. We resect. Sometimes the amount of fat is minuscule, like here, myelolipoma, particularly with the calcification. And sometimes it's very large, and here you can see the density, which means it bled previously. Some people say anything above 5, some people say anything above 8, you should resect. If patients are symptomatic, they resect very quickly. You don't want a case like this where you have bleeding, and you can have substantial bleed, and the patient can exsanguinate. Um, a couple articles, this article by Peria, myelipoma is an uncommon benign tumor composed of mature adipose cells and hemopoietic tissue. Myelipomas occasionally cause discomfort due to compression or hemorrhage. Another example here, just to make a point about adrenals, 
You look at that, it kind of looks like an adrenal mass coming off the lateral limb, but then you follow it up and look, it's continuous with the stomach. And so at times, gastric lesions can mimic um, adrenal lesions on the left, and we've seen that with duplication cysts, for example. Um, so again, you want to be very careful. So we've covered a couple things now. I've covered kidney, I've covered adrenal incidentalomas. Let's take a look at pancreatic incidentalomas. But we f before we attack this very difficult subject, let's take a five-minute coffee break. And I'll see you in five. Bye-bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.